Okay, uh, we're back again. Um, this is lecture two of, of week two's uh, series of lectures, um, Fundamentals of, of ID Epidemiology. Uh, I'm going to show it like this because uh, in the format where it's all over the screen, I can't see the slides that are coming up and it makes it sort of confusing, confusing to talk about. So we're just gonna talk about it, like do it like this. Um, okay, so today uh, we're going to be talking about uh, the biology of infectious disease, hosts and pathogens. Um, just a brief definition, I don't know if we've actually defined this. Um, the host uh, is the, the organism that, that literally hosts uh, the pathogen, and the pathogen um, is, is the organism that, that enters the host um, uses the host for replication or for sustenance, um, and then in some cases causes disease. Um, in general, when we say pathogen, we are, are referring to disease-causing um, agents um, that, that enter a host and, and cause um, different levels of illness. Um, obviously, uh, we are hosts for all different kinds of organisms that do not cause disease. Um, so we generally don't call those things pathogens because they don't create a pathology, for example. Um, but um, when we, we are, we, we host all different kinds of organisms is my point here. And some cause disease and some don't. The ones that do, we call pathogens. Okay. So different factors of the host will impact susceptibility and thus transmissibility. Um, so for example, uh, genetics is one um, aspect of the host which, which will uh, impact its, its fitness for a pathogen um, to, to, to enter the body and, and replicate and provide sustenance for itself. Um, and so we refer to this as, as nature, right? What you're innately born with. Um, and we see this with lots of different pathogens. Um, malaria uh, is one thing. So for example, um, people with uh, sickle cell anemia are, are less likely to be infected with Plasmodium vivax, uh, Plasmodium infections than, 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 than other people. And this is something that they're born with. Um, they're born with an innate resistance. Now, the host um, can also be impacted by its environment, this environment that it experiences um, growing up. Um, and this is the nurture uh, category. Um, so what a person, not what a person is born with, but what, what, they, what they exist in throughout um, childhood and into adulthood um, and beyond. So for example, uh, like a person who is um, born into an area where there is not clean water, for example, is more susceptible to waterborne pathogens than, than, than people who are not. Um, a person who, uh, for example, um, has been exposed to other pathogens that create cross immunity, this happens too. Um, this is just anything that you could experience when, you, when you're growing up. And the next thing is, is previous exposure, which is experience. So nature, nurture, and experience. And this would be ex experience directly related to the pathogen of interest. So for example, immunity. Uh, and all of these things add up um, to create susceptibility in the host. And the level of susceptibility, obviously, you know, since we're talking about um, things like nurture and previous exposure, the level of susceptibility of a host can change over its lifetime. Um, it can get more susceptible or less susceptible, either one. Um, and we see all different types of cases for all different types of pathogens. On the extreme case, uh, something like measles, for example, if you're infected with it in childhood, um, you're pretty much guaranteed that, that you will be um, non-susceptible to future measles, measles infections for the rest of your life. Um, for example, things like malaria, this is not necessarily true. Um, you get, might get infected once and, and, and immunity wanes, or you might not be resistant to a particular um, genetic profile of, of plasmodium that causes sickness later. Um, there's all different sorts of cases. Um, and then there's, of course, pathogens that, that, that don't impart any sort of immunity at all. All different kinds of, of, of scenarios and situations. But the point here is that nature, nurture, and the experience of the host with the pathogen are important to create a level of susceptibility. Now, to further complicate things, 
Um, susceptibility leads to transmission, um, which again can feed back into to all these all these three things before. So, for example, like you know, generationally generationally speaking, um, transmission of pathogens can lead to um, like so selection of of children for certain traits that resist. Um, so that they pass on pass on genes that 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 render their children um, immune or resistant to pathogen um, transmission of pathogens can influence uh, how humans interact with their environment. For example, so for example, malaria transmission led to massive changes in in how we deal with with water and sanitation um, and where we live um, back in the malaria days in the North, North America um, and completely changed the landscape of how we, how we live. Um, and, you know, transmission obviously impacts previous exposure because the more time you're exposed to something, the more likely you are to be susceptible in some cases for some pathogens. More on this later, I really don't want to scare anyone with the, the complexity of all this. Um, I just want to sort of indicate that idea is complex. There's lots of factors that go into it. Um, and to me, that's, that's why it's such an interesting um, field to study. And I hope you, I hope, I hope you agree over the course of this term. Um, we're going to delve more into these things later. So, um, we, when we talk about infectious disease transmission, we're not just talking about uh, biology of the host. We're also talking about biology of the pathogens because they're also organisms, and and they react to changes in the environment, they react to our own genetic, our, our own immune response, um, they, they change genetically. Um, we've seen lots of cases, you know, for example, influenza is one case that um, changes rapidly from year to year. This is why one um, vaccine from one year is not necessarily applicable to the next because the pathogen changes um, rapidly. Um, HIV, um, is is another one. Um, there's there's all different kinds of diseases out there that that change rapidly. Um, have 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 high levels of variability. Malaria is one. Um, so when we talk about transmissibility, transmissibility, infectivity, and pathogenicity, um, we're talking about factors of both the host and the pathogen. So again. ID is extremely compli complicated and complex, um, and I think that's what's amazing about it. Um, and we're going to be delving into some more of these topics over the course of the term. But now, what I want to introduce you to is the host pathogen environment disease triangle. Um, <clears throat> so basically, three things have to come together. Um, pathogens have to come into contact with hosts. And hosts have to be in a conducive environment. Pathogens have to be in a conducive environment to create disease. All these things have to uh, cross over into one another, come together to create conditions that create disease. Um, and this is a Venn diagram. Um, sometimes it's presented um, as a triangle, um, all different kinds of ways. But the point is, host, pathogen, environment. Um, it's very important. We're going to talk more about this over the course of the course. So again, um, when we talk about ID, uh, cases themselves become exposures and thus are risk factors. Um, I not hope that, that every one of you has heard that term risk factor, um, some sort of factor that, that increases risk for disease. Um, infection in one person can be transmitted to others, all of whom may or may not show symptoms. And here we have a scenario where uh, one person has been infected and they've spread to the people proximal to them who have spread to other people and there's been newly infected people coming in to this, this small population of, of people. And then of course there's recoveds in there and we're going to talk about this when we get to uh, the section on infectious disease transmission and modeling. Um, and why uh, infection and recovery are important in a number of susceptible people. So this is sort of, you know, a picture illustrating um, what happens when an infected person comes in to a population. So, for example, right now um, in COVID-19 era, um, you know, one of the reasons that we do practice social distancing and do things like masks is, is to prevent uh, transmission to others because when we transmit to others, they in turn transmit to other people themselves. 
So <clears throat> best to nip it in the bud if we can. So the rationale for ID research, um, in most cases in infectious disease research, uh, the cause is often known. An infection, infectious agent is a necessary cause, um, but not always sufficient. Um, and when we say it's not sufficient, um, we go back to that, that nature nurture um, previous experience slide that I presented before where a pathogen can come in um, and, 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 and find hosts, um, but it's not necessarily just the pathogen and the, and the host in the, by themselves that create conditions for the disease. It's all these other things that go into it as well, host factors and pathogen factors and environmental factors. Um, but when we talk about ID, we have to talk about an infectious agent. Otherwise, we're not talking about ID. We're talking about something else. So what is infectious disease epidemiology used for? Well, a lot of things. Um, surveillance of infectious disease. Uh, we want to see, uh, surveil to see if, if there's new cases, how many they are, um, how bad they are, um, um, how rapidly they're occurring, all these different things, um, it, with, the, with the aim of, of preventing um, more um, cases. <clears throat> We want to identify the source of outbreaks, so we want to find uh, the place that, that people might have been infected, where is the source of infection, the source of cases. Um, we want to look for novel emerging infections, so for example, like HIV and SARS, or you know, more recently COVID-19. Um, we want to pay attention and see if there's new um, pathogens that, that are start starting to be transmitted with, uh, between human hosts because they're always appearing, um, as we've seen over the past couple decades. Um, and we talked about last time. Uh, we want to study routes of transmission and the natural history of infections, because if we know about routes of transmission, um, we can devise ways uh, to stop transmission. So before you can stop something, you have to understand how it works, and you find sort of an actionable factor, an actionable piece in that transmission chain um, that you can use to develop an intervention to stop that chain. Uh, identification and evaluation of new interventions. Um, we do ID research to, to create new ways of preventing disease and create new ways of protect, protecting the public health. Um, an evidence, an evidence base for interventions um, because we're collecting data. Um, we're looking at um, cases and the nature of cases um, to provide evidence um, to create new interventions based on limited resources. So uh, ID epi iceberg, and it's a giant iceberg. Uh, symptoms can range the gamut. Um, for you know certain pathogens, uh, others can be more serious, but you know there's generally this range going from severe to none. Um, you know certainly you know diseases like like Ebola are very dramatic. Um, they prevent they, they uh, present with with extreme uh, levels of symptoms and and high case fatality rates. Uh, whereas other things like you know for example we've seen with COVID nineteen. Uh, there can be many subclinical or, or, or asymptomatic um, individuals out there that we're missing. Um, there are, you know, in fact, might be causing uh, disease, or causing, causing transmission. Um, so for severe symptoms, uh, the data is generally good uh, because these people usually present to the hospital at some point. Um, you know, more severe cases of COVID-19 are likely to go to the hospital because they, uh, they you know, can't breathe, for example. <coughs> um, Ebola, for example, is another one. Uh, moderate symptoms, generally good. Um, again, um, these are, you know, have cl symptoms clinic clinically recognizable enough where, where they'll go to, the, go to a hospital or a clinic or a doctor or at least do a Google search on something um, so that we can collect data on this. Mild, moderate to poor. Um, so, for example, you know, like common colds that aren't very serious. Uh, we really don't know a whole lot about some of them because uh, they just don't cause symptoms severe enough for people to go to, to a doctor and they never get entered into any sort of database. Uh, none, question mark, to none, none being subclinical, uh, poor. 
very poor, obviously. Uh, some diseases, uh, for example, in most cases are, are harmless, um, but in a very rare number of cases um, become severe. And those, those cases, they, there can be um, very little knowledge about it. So for example, like you know, polio was, was fairly mysterious for a long time because obviously people experienced paralysis, but they were so rare among polio cases that, that uh, the connections weren't, weren't necessarily made that quickly, but that's a long time ago. But that's just an example, right? Just a simple example. Obviously, you know, we have um, a, a long way to go, a long way to go. All right. So that's all I'm going to talk about for this second lecture of this three lecture series. I'm trying to break things up because I think that y'all will be more likely to watch the lectures uh, if they're shorter. Um, I know I would. Um, easy, easier, easier to digest. Um, so again, um, if you have any questions or anything you don't, you know, isn't clear to you or just want to reach out and say, hi, I'm here, um, you know, provide criticism for the class, positive or negative, you know, please reach out. Um, and my email is on the syllabus. So, great. Thank you very much.